In this edition of Inside Racing, we acknowledge the remarkable achievements of George Moore, who passed away in Sydney this week, aged 84. George's legendary riding career finished in spectacular fashion in 1971, when at his final race ride, he won the Victoria Derby on Classic Mission. His 2,278th career win, 312 of those were in Metropolitan Stakes races, with 119 at Group 1 level. As a trainer, George won 11 Hong Kong premierships and in 1986 became the first jockey to be inducted into the Australian Sporting Hall of Fame. I spent a wonderful day with George and Iris Moore on the Gold Coast about five years ago, recording an interview destined to be George's last. By way of a special tribute, we present again this three-part interview with a man regarded by many to be the greatest jockey ever produced in Australia. Here comes Classic Mission, and Moore said, let's go for Mr. Gow. At the furlong pole, out I come, tackled by Cullum, but look at the red-headed Classic Mission wide out in the middle, with Moore throwing everything at it. Classic Mission takes the lead, and Classic Mission comes away to win the 1971 derby. G'day, George. G'day, Johnny. How are you, mate? Lovely to see you. Good to see you again. Well, I'm not surprised to see you looking at distant horizons because you've been doing that most of your life and you seem to reach most of them too. Well, I was pretty lucky, I suppose, wasn't I? Yeah. But uh, it's great to be here looking at this too. Out on the beach, you know. Oh, beautiful. Absolutely. Now I know how James Stewart felt in that Hitchcock movie, Vertigo. <laughs> You've got to get used to that. No, it's nothing to it. How long have you been here? 20 years. I sold the house because... Uh, I thought when we were away so much that uh, we could just lock up and go. Yeah. Instead of having a house that you had to put a caretaker in and all that. Yeah. Which I had a nice house out in the river. No, this does me, but the other thing now the wife wants to move to Sydney, but I think after uh, being down there for two weeks, she's changed her mind a bit. Yeah. I think that uh, he might think it's better up here. Hey mate, I can feel that sun beating down on the top of my old melon. We better get inside. Good man. No trouble. George, you've got a million wonderful photos, you, a lot John. of memorabilia, and uh, during the course of our interview, we'll have a look at most of these photos. I could sure. you know, notice Tullock sure. hiding over there behind yeah. that lovely bunch of flowers. Yeah, old Tullock. Look at him there in full flight. Yeah. Is that the Victoria Derby? Yep, that's a painting that was done in Paris off the off the uh, just the ordinary photograph. But uh, oh, he was really something, that old fella. Mate, I'm going to put you in a position you've occupied on many an occasion the world over, behind the bar. Ah, <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, it's and good I'll to be the barman because you don't have to drink so much then. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> well, you're not short of a given name, are you? George Thomas Donald Moore. Yeah, I know. I didn't used to like to carry the Donald at one part of it. George Thomas was OK because that was my uncle. Yeah. And uh, Donald was my other uncle. He was my mother's brother. Yeah. From Scot they come from Scotland. Yeah. But uh, I didn't fancy the GTD too often. <laughs> but George was your dad? George was my father, yes. Yeah, lovely photo here of your father, and he was a noble-looking man, wasn't he? Yeah, that it? was the day he got married. That's taken when he got married. So, uh, and I haven't got, I've got plenty of my mother, but uh, not like that. That's right, it's really special. Mum's name was Elsie? Elsie Jessie Cameron. And she lived to a grand age? Yeah, 92. They all live well in the Moore family. I just hope that I can catch up and keep going. Was she a proud mum? Yeah, she got a lot of fun out of her latter part of her life. She worked very hard after her father died. She went cooking, she used to do laundry, she used to do all sorts of jobs. And, uh, and then when I got going, I took her from Mackay, from Mackay down to, to Brisbane. Yeah. And then I went from Brisbane to Sydney. Yeah. And she never worked another day in her life, except when I gave her a bit to do. That was yeah. all. Now, were you born and reared on the land in Mackay? Yeah. Yes, I rode my first show when I was five. My father took me to the show in Mackay. We lived, and we lived at Pinnacle at the time. And uh, I rode and uh, the bloke said, you've got to disband. I said, I, I can't. He said, why? I said, he'll bite me on the bum when I go to get back. <laughs> and the pony. <laughs> on the pony, so I, I yeah. can throw it out. Yeah. But I did win Boy Rider later, about five years later. Here's a lovely old photo uh, of, a, of a show jumper. 
a little grey mare called Bee's Wing. Yeah. The rider is George Thomas Donald Moore at 11 years of age. And look at you posing for the camera. Yeah, you're telling me. I was looking at the bike. I said, look, I want to see what he's doing. <laughs> well, she actually belonged to another chap. I rode her for him the year before, and then I bought her off him for three pounds and took me, I think, six months to pay her off, doing odd jobs for around, around Mackay. Three quid? Yep. Took a long time. You went to Brisbane around 1938, and your first indentureship was with a man called Louis Dahl. That's right. He met me at Padgett Junction and uh, took me home, and uh, in the next five minutes I, after I'd arrived home, I had a message to take the milk up to the Catholic Church. So I worked all the time. I had all the rot jobs at Mr. Dahl's, I can tell you. <laughs> Is that the reason you transferred to Jim Sheen? Oh, he, no, I, that wasn't the reason. I would have went anywhere, but uh, he wouldn't let me go. But he sold me, actually, for £250. Alan Cooper paid for me. He bought me and gave me to Sheen. And uh, they also made my mother buy a house. Ra my racing had its own slave trade, eh? Yeah, they told me. <laughs> yeah, we bought a house. Is that all you were worth? 250 That's quid? That's right. Your first winner was on a metropolitan track, Eagle Farm. The year was 1940, and the horse's name uh, is something that you didn't have to worry about for the rest of your life. No, Overdraft. I wouldn't agree with that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, well, actually, I spent it was the Sunday. I spent the Sunday down here at Main Beach with the Conquest girls and, on a truck, and uh, I was sunburned as hell. And uh, I had this ride on Overdraft. And I got up and beat Stan Reynolds. He, he finished up owning the hotel over here at uh, in Southport. Yeah. And uh, I, somebody said to me, "You better go outside and see him. You might get something." I said, "Well, what, what am I? What, what, what am I going to get?" He said, "They might give me some money." So I went out and he gave me a ten-pound note, old Gleason. In nineteen forty. A ten-pound note. Tenner. Ten-pound note. How was that? Well, I thought I was a millionaire straight away. It was huge. Sleep. It was. So I took it home to my mother. Yeah. Uh, well, I tell you what, it was great to be able to go home and give her ten pounds. Yeah. Now your first major win was on Expressman, and uh, it was at the race called the Doomben Newmarket. That's right. Later to become the ten thousand. Yes. Well, actually, I, how I started riding him, I won an apprentice race on him, and then I won a flying on him, and then he had uh, seven stone six, I think it was, or seven stone four in the Doomben Newmarket, and they couldn't find anybody to, to ride him. And that's how I got the ride, actually, because mm. I could make the weight. And I got up and beat old Morris McCartan on Berlin. Now, during World War II, you joined the first Labor Company, and you organised things in such a way that you were able to continue riding in races, as did Neville Selwood, who was based in Townsville. Yeah, I was able to ride. We only raced three Saturdays a month at yeah. Albion Park. And then I got the offer to ride Gooseboy in the Metropolitan, and Eric worked at the, I got a bit of leave to go to Sydney and I got beat the heads that turned out, got a bunch. And uh, the headlines got in the paper, how did Private Moore, how was he able to get to Sydney and all oh, my sons can't move and oh, do the elder play. Yeah. Anyway, uh, he said, well, he'd earned it, he'd been, uh, you know, had worked on it times he shouldn't have, which I hadn't. And, uh, but they still wanted to know how I got on a plane to get to Sydney. Anyway. You won a Brisbane Jockeys Premiership during that period as an apprentice and I think you got up to be bustling Billy Briscoe. Yeah, he'd been champion jockey seven years, Bill, and I got up and beat him. Uh, he was in the army too, old Bill. Uh, nearly all of us, there was a heap of us in the army. You finished your apprenticeship in Sydney with a very famous man, Peter Riddle, uh, who'd made a name for himself in harness racing and also as a thoroughbred trainer, and he's the man that prepared one of the greats of the 40s, Shannon. But I beat him in the Breeders' Plate. I rode uh, uh, for Daddy Lewis, Victory Boy, Victory Lad, yeah. and I got up and beat him. Now beat that him Breeders' down. Plate win on Victory Lad was probably the, the one that kick-started your career in Sydney. I, it helped, yes. It helped, yes. But Cordale did too. There was a lot of... Uh, you know, winning the, the Metropolitan on him, and then I won the Sydney Cup, or I won the Sydney Cup, he had seven stone seven, which I don't know what that is today. Yeah. And then I won the Metropolitan. So those braces for Gordon Ray, but... There's a great character, trainer yes. Gordon Ray. Yeah. Well, I rode a lot of winners. I was practically his stable jockey for a long time. He's a pretty clever trainer, they say. Yeah, he's, he was cute. He, he done a good job, he was a battler, and he, he got up, but uh, I don't know what happened to Gordon at the finish, he just went out of it somehow or other. He had a great owner called uh, Randall, 
and uh, he he owned a Cordale at the time, Elliot Randall. He was the one when I won the Sydney Cup, he gave me the car. That was part of the chop, actually. <laughs> I said to him, listen, he said, oh, there's a thousand there for you if uh, you win, win it. I said, can I have that Buick car as well? He said, no, you can, you can have the Buick car, but you can't have all the thousand. So I think he gave me 500, I got the Buick, big Buick. George met Tommy Smith years before he became stable jockey for the legendary trainer. The meeting took place on a Melbourne bound train in 1939. George was looking after horses for his boss, Jim Sheehan. Tommy was looking after horses for his boss, Max Sawyer. George talks about that fateful meeting after this break on Inside Racing. Sounds like something from the old Alfred Hitchcock movie, Strangers on a Train. You met Tommy Smith, he boarded at Albury. That's right. I was on the train with, we had three horses going through. We had McCorber, Gold Salute, and Azorian was an old plod sort of a horse. Yeah. And he, I was looking after him, and Tommy got on with Dollar and Fearless at Albury. I think it's Albury. And uh, he went to Caulfield, uh, I went to Godby's. Uh, we stayed there, and, and Tom, uh, he was next door in Quinlan's. So we had about six weeks down there, I think. And uh, we used to play cricket out at the uh, 1400 metres. Mm -hmm. And TJ used to, used to say to me, you'll be my jockey one day, and I'll be the leading trainer. And they say, oh, this poor bugger. He, the, Tommy at the time, he had never trained a winner. He was only looking after these two horses. You thought he was a dreamer? You know, for sure, we all thought he was the dreamer, because he used to keep telling me that I was, I was going, he was going to be the leading trainer, I was going to be his jockey, and I hadn't ridden a winner at the time. And he hadn't trained. And he hadn't trained a horse. <laughs> <laughs> hey, that's my cue to spring a surprise. Here is a little black and white photograph sent to me by a viewer, a sky racing viewer. Now there is a snap of yourself and friends at Frank Godby Stables in Melbourne on that very trip you were talking about in 1939. Yeah, that's true. There's Neville Selwood there, his brother Jim, and the other lad worked for uh, Jim Sheen, and the other chap on the right, he worked for Godbiss. But that's a long time ago, isn't it? What's that? 50 years? 61. 61 years. 61 years ago, <laughs> yeah, wasn't it yesterday? It's, it's very, it kept very well. Tommy did, of course, go on to realise his dream. He became a leading trainer, after not too many years, but it took him a long time to recognise your talents. He didn't put you on for ages, did he? No, well, I was tied up with a lot of other trainers, actually. Uh, and Tom didn't have the firepower at that time for me to really sort of be his jockey. It, it sort of just, what would you call it, it just gradually wore in that I become his jockey. What about your first winner for TJ? Yeah, well, it was quite humorous later but it wasn't humorous at the time now, i was playing golf and i said to my mother we we're living up at dover heights and i said look if uh, bill kerwin rings for me to ride native son take the ride so anyway i come home and uh, i said mr kerwin rings he said no but a very nice man rang me and i took the ride i said don't tell me it's bragger she said that's right that's its name i said oh i better kill you mum taking the ride, that's got no charge. Anyway, I won on it. And that's how I started the first winner for teacher. He, I, I tell you what, he didn't give me any sling, I can tell you that. I got my 5% off the club, and that was as far as it went. Yeah, but old TJ. What sort of a man was he in the 1940s? Now, cast your mind back 60 years. What sort of a bloke was he then? Well, he was like Arthur Murray, you know, taught, him, taught you dancing in a hurry. He wanted to be a leading trainer in a hurry. Was he an impatient type? Yeah, he used to work the horses hard, but he didn't have the, the firepower he got later. Yeah, did know. he work them harder then than any other trainer? Yes, yeah. 
He used to go So he was revolutionary? Yes. He used to break all the rules, I reckon. The tra other trainers, they thought he w he'd go he'd go backwards. Well, he must have been the first to recognise that this animal could cop more work than blokes were giving him. Exactly right. Exactly right. Now, your clashes with TJ were legendary. He was a, a little on the feisty side and so was G. Moore. Some of the clashes were quite uninhibited. You didn't care who was listening. Now, was it because he felt you needed him and vice versa? Yeah, he thought that, but I didn't. No. <laughs> Personally, I, could, I, I was sure I could go without TJ. At that time, I probably could have later too, but that, that I think you're li up leading up to the, uh, the one when I... Uh, Gallop the horse yeah. flat out down to the barrier before the Doncaster. What was his name again? His name was Oakland. <laughs> I can still see you breaking out of the parade before the race, charging down past the winning post at a hundred mile an hour and you were red in the face. You were filthy. Yeah, I was. I was very annoyed because I knew how to ride uh, Oakland. Tommy didn't have to tell me. And he gave me a whole bunch of stupid instructions which I thought were crazy, including a fast preliminary. So I went looking for the chief steward to tell him, but I couldn't find him. So I said to Cecil, what, what do you reckon? He said, well, just do it. So I went out there and I done the fast preliminary. I kicked him up out of the gate, which was the opposite way to, to ride him. And when I come in, he blew up and, and screamed out, what are you so-and-so doing? And yeah. Anyway, I told him what to do with himself. And I said, ride the rest for the, for the day yourself. So I didn't ride the last two races. Anyhow, about three weeks later, I was riding winners for everybody. I was riding work at the mile, and uh, there was a knock on the door. We were living at uh, Darling Point. Iris went to the door, and here's TJ. And she said, it's TJ. I said, well, let him come in. So he come charging in. He said, I'm bloody sick of this. He said, they're cheering you and booing me. You better come back and ride for me again. <laughs> That's true. He couldn't stand it. No. He, he, he was getting all the bad publicity. I was getting all the good stuff. Yeah, that was TJ, but he was like that. That's how he used to do things. You know? George, did you like him? Well, uh, well, let me see. I would like to be on a desert island with him with, uh, with one loaf of bread. I reckon I'd be getting the crust and he'd be uh, eating the rest while you wasn't looking. He was careful with a quid, was he? Uh, yeah, he hated to pay you, I can tell you that. And he used to carry the checks around for about three months. But we were... I, w I wouldn't call him a brother, I'd call him a cousin, in, uh, sort of thing. But uh, he was always doing something that we were going to do, things that were nearly impossible, you know? And I used to say to myself, God, how can this bloke even think like that? But he'd do it, he'd, something had come along and it'd work out. Now, what sort of a loser was he, you know, on a day-to-day -day basis through the years? Say you've got five or six runners, three of them are favourites, you're on them all. What if you did get back a bit too far on one or go a bit early on one? How did he cop that? He was a terrific loser, terrific. We'd all go down to Romano's and drink champagne that night. And he, he, he wouldn't even say, he might say, well, we better knock this down, you didn't ride too well today, we'll get, get going here next week. Yeah. But you know, he, he was a very good loser. must have been a revelation for a young George Moore to walk into the jockey's room, let's say at Randwick, look around that room and take in the talent that must have been sitting there in the 30s and 40s. Well, I mean, who were your favourites? Who were these, the senior jockeys that you looked up to? 
well, uh, Derby for number one. And old McCartan, old Morris was getting towards the end of his career. He was sitting there writing. Uh, there was Jack Parsons, Tomo. Um, and Bill Cook was another uh, one of your Bill, favorites. Bill, yes. Yeah. Uh, that, there were so many. You could have, you know, they used to have a saying in those days, you could throw the colors in the room and there'd, there'd be yep. 10 jockeys you could put on and would do the job. And you, know? you agree with that old saying? I do, yes. I still go in the jockeys, but every time I go racing, you know, I go and walk through and you don't see the boys yeah. in there. There are still photos of you hanging yeah, up in well, the Landry jockeys room. Yeah, there used to be, but I, I forget who sit down in my corner. I, I took over from Freddie Sheen because that's where they uh, used to uh, send out for the bottle of ginger ale and in, in, in would come the straight whiskey or the straight brandy and uh, they'd have their little drink in there so nobody could see them behind the corner. So there were cases of jockeys riding slightly intoxicated in that era? Uh, by the Would they the be usually jockeys who, uh, whose nerve maybe wasn't what it had been? I they don't just know. needed a steadier? Well, I think that might be something to that, but uh, I know Andy Knox fell off one day at the furlong pail and couldn't get back on. <laughs> they had the clerk of the course had to put him on, he couldn't get on. But uh, they were all pretty plastered by the end of the day, both of them. <laughs> <laughs> who were the best jockeys you rode against overseas? Pick it by lengths. Reigned supreme, didn't he? Uh, on his own. On his own. Actually, what, what was his secret, Lester Piggott? He was just great, I don't know. Because he rode, he rode so short, he had a whip that you could crack, which you wouldn't have got away with in Australia. And uh, he done his homework, he done great homework on the form, he knew the form backwards. But I can tell a bit of a story here about Lester. When I went to ride for Merlis, I'm riding a horse called uh, Lauren Zacchio at, uh, on the July course. He came to start in Australia later. Yeah. Mm. And uh, he came to me and he said, uh, give, this a, uh, give this an easy run. That's how he used to speak, because he had a pediment, you know. I said, why should I? He said, because I bloody own it. <laughs> at that time. There is Charlie St George's name, but he said, I bloody well own it. Yeah. That's what. So it won. I got left six and one by six, so that's how much it had on him, you know. So the next day I'm riding another one. And he came to me and he said, you know, me the same than me. I said, don't tell me how this one too. He said, yeah, it won. And he said, oh, I'll never make any money out of these horses. Yeah. And he's got them with, with Merlis. All right, you've mentioned horse ownership. And that leads me to a new subject and a new question. I'm sure the name Flying East rings a big bell. Mm -hmm. Flying East won a race at Hawkesbury in about 1953 on protest. You rode in the same race, unplaced. A few days later it was discovered that Flying East was in the ownership of a fella called George Moore. And it turned out to be an unhappy ending for you. I bought Flying East at a sale off Mr Dewsbury, who was on the committee, the AJC at the time, at auction. I sent it to a Scorpion, she never got in foal. I sent it to the horse that won the Melbourne Cup, I can't remember, never got in foal. And I put it on a train to send it to Ewan to run with Thimble, my stallion up there. In the meantime, I get a call from uh, Ray Bagore. He said, uh, have you got a spare horse? I said, no. And he said, I said, why, what do you want a horse for? He said, oh, Colin Butterworth, he wants to get a permit to train horses and he's got to have a horse. I said, well, funny thing, I got two on the train, you had to take them off in Brisbane, and because you had to change the gauge, you know? And I said, he can have one of them. But he said, well, he, what can we have? I said, I'll take Flying East, it's never run. It's never run the race, and it's been a stud, but it'll get him his license, and he worked out at the Butterworth. So, okay. About three months later, I get a call. Hey, that thing goes pretty good. But Colin can win a race with it, but he's got no money. Can you get somebody to put anything, something on for him at Albion Park? I said, OK, I ran Monkey Nailer up. I said, put under on for him. OK, put under on, run second. Then he rang me up about it three weeks later. He said, it'll win again at Doom. And I said, oh, you're crazy. This thing's no good. I put another 100 on for him and run second again. The next thing, I took Tommy Hill down to Sydney to get his shoulder fixed. And Colin Butterworth arrived with the bloody horse. I said, gee whiz, what have you got this thing here for, you know? Mm. So they're broke. He's broke, Hill, he's broke, Butterworth, so I've got to become the captain. So he, he, he galloped and he said, it'll win at Hawkesbury. I said, oh, gee, leave me alone, will you? 
Anyway, I was riding a horse for uh, Majestic, I think I was riding. And I told the owner, I said, look, there's a thing in this race, it, it's in my father-in-law's name, but I own it, and the speed is stud and all this sort of thing. Yeah. So away we go in the race. Pulling up, Tommy he'd come riding up, he said, I said, how'd you go? He said, I'll get the race. He said, that, uh, what's his name, knocked me down at the home turn. I said, I oh, too far away, too far away. So I went back into the room. Next thing, the protest was upheld. Then all hell broke loose. Everybody was going on crazy. The Moors fixed the race and all. So anyway, finally they had me in, into the AJC. And uh, I told them the truth. I got, I got Catherine of Order, I think they called it in those days, in no time. So I went to Uvenden and kept writing letters in and wrote writing letters in. And you got three years? Three years. Well, I asked for a set for a time because I was on, they never gave me any time. Yeah. And they made it three years. So after about two and a half years, I got a telephone call. I used to put one in every, Jim Cameron used to put one in every gym. Yeah. I, I got a uh, call. Right. Tom Powell said, you want to get your license back? I said, of course I do. What am I going to do? Who am I going to kill? He said, it's going to cost you. George hasn't pulled any punches in this week's edition of Inside Racing, and there's more to come. Next time, he tells of his bitterness over the flying East affair and admits that he returned to the saddle a changed man. I made up my mind when I came back I was going to be champion jockey. <laughs> <laughs>